gives me pleasure to welcome you all. This is a very special evening for me personally because of many reasons. One is uh, our speaker is a, is a very good friend and uh, a person whom I learn from and I encourage you to do so if you visit his uh, Facebook uh, and his Twitter. Uh, and one interesting concept I learned uh, is one we need badly in this country called uh, the loyal opposition. In Britain they have uh, Her Majesty's loyal opposition. They are opposition but they are loyal and uh, that's the that's a concept which we or a philosophy or a culture that we need to develop I think in uh, in our part of the world, that uh, being an opposition doesn't mean that you cannot be loyal as well. And it goes both ways for the government being opposed to look at this opposition as a loyal opposition and for the opposition itself to, to behave uh, in loyalty. And I, uh, I think it's an interesting concept. But uh, also because uh, his Excellency is, uh, is, is a very special person in, in the way of uh, his formation. Uh, he arrived in Amman on the 13th, uh, in February last year to take his post. Previously he was the High Commissioner to Cyprus. He served in a number of diplomatic uh, assignments. He was also Director of Security in the Foreign Commonwealth Office. So that's another perspective which is very interesting at these times, at all times actually. He also served as uh, Deputy Head of Mission in Athens and since our Minister of Finance said that unless we do something we're going to face the same future Athens is facing, maybe we can get some, some advice uh, on how not to face that uh, future which I warned against a year ago uh, when I was in the Senate I sent a letter uh, out to all concerned exactly in the same language, but that was a year ago, that unless we do something about it, uh, we will have to face the consequences uh, Greece uh, met. Uh, his, he served in Doha, and he served in energy, and served in many other uh, interesting positions. Uh, we are delighted that uh, his daughter is with us here tonight. We welcome you. And you, I'm sure you, you feel the pride in your father, the, the pride I feel in him as a friend. Uh, uh, what we are going to hear today is uh, also very interesting. That's why I said it's a very special evening, because we're going to hear about something which is productive. In politics, which is political, everything is political, everything is not politics. The Americans talk about politics and they mean the, the competition between the two parties. This is politics. Politics in the U.S. means uh, the issues that of difference and uh, competition between the various uh, elective, elected uh, or election campaigns. Uh, but uh, in politics and uh, life are very much entwined and one protect, productive side of politics is education. And I'm very glad that the subject is education. That's because we are focusing very much as an organization. We're becoming an educational institution uh, much more than uh, anything else. And we have plans which uh, I'm sure uh, you will hear about uh, at another occasion. But uh, uh, Today we are talking about education from also a very important perspective, education for employment. And it so happens that the World Bank report just came out on education for the year, for, uh, for the period 2020, talks about education for employability. Uh, perhaps they have borrowed the term from you. So, uh, but that is also the sense of direction of the global community is that education should uh, not be 
structured in the abstract, it should be directed for the purpose of reliability. I'm not here to speak, but I just wanted to say that I'm very glad that this is the subject tonight. Uh, His Excellency was kind enough to accept to answer questions after his presentation as a priority on the same subject, but also on any other subject, including uh, subjects uh, which relate to to the, well, of course you have the, the right to answer and not to answer, but uh, I mean, you can ask. I said you can ask any question. I didn't say he will answer any question. So, um, I, I was very specific. <laughs> so you can ask whatever you like. Uh, and uh, Let me uh, stop here and say uh, Thank you for accepting our invitation. It's been a long time I've been trying to get His Excellency here, and we are honored at Talal Abu Ghazali Forum to have uh, such a distinguished speaker. Thank you, sir. Well, thank, thank you very much, and thank you very much for your kind words. Um, I, too, am honored. I'm honored by the invitation. Um, I'm honoured by the audience who have come to hear what I have to say, and I'm honoured also to have the, the opportunity to speak to you about a subject which I think is, uh, is very important. Uh, you, you sketched out uh, a long career, uh, and I suppose you, you know, people might wonder how I managed to pack so much in uh, to a diplomatic career. Well, uh, when I joined, you could join when you were only 12 years old, so, uh, so you can do the maths and calculate from that. So, ladies and gentlemen, my aim this evening is to talk to you about a subject, employment for business. So what do we mean by the simple phrase, employment for business? For me, it means how governments and the private sector need to work together to ensure that schools and universities are producing the people that business needs. I'll give you a few examples from British policy, which I hope you'll find interesting. But my starting point is an obvious one, is the scourge of unemployment. It it affects many parts of the world, and a person who is unemployed, who is unable to feed his or her family, suffers from lack of dignity suffers from frustration of being unable to change things. This frustration is a fundamental driver for change in the Middle East. We've seen it on our screens many times, from the vegetable seller in Tunisia, humiliated by being unable to sell his goods, to the crowds in Tahrir Square who objected to the dictator's (coughs) corruption. So the question for all countries and for countries in this region is how to create new jobs. We've all heard figures of the proportion of the population in this part of the world under 25, in countries like Jordan, up to 70%. Regionally, the challenge of generating new job opportunities is enormous. I've seen statistics that say 50 million new jobs are needed in the Middle East by 2020. The growth in population creates a time bomb unless new jobs can be created. But they're not going to be created out of thin air, and nor will they be created in the same way as in the past. So, something has to change. Now, I've also heard it, heard it said that the Arab world is different, that the industrial revolutions that we saw in Europe 150 years ago, or in Japan, Korea, China in the last 50 years, couldn't happen here. Now, I don't accept that. I don't believe there is any cultural reason why 50 million new jobs can't be created in the Arab countries. So how can this be done? The essential policy issue is that each country has to make itself competitive and each country has to play to its strengths. One of Jordan's strengths is its people (coughs) and the high level of education that Jordanians have enjoyed. But is that education system producing the people that investors in Jordan need? I hear businessmen complain that graduates lack the skills that they need to employ them. So how can this skills gap be bridged? I think that learning from other countries' experience here can be instructive. So let me highlight some of the key points from British experience and British policy. And I have to emphasize this is not because our experience is perfect, but because I think it illustrates some important points. And I think 
countries can not only learn from what others have done well, but they can also learn from the mistakes that have been made in other countries. So turning to UK experience, let me start by recalling that in 1997, a new government was elected in the UK, and the new Prime Minister, standing on the steps of Downing Street, was asked to give his top three priorities. And his answer was, education, education, education. There is no doubt that education has to be crafted to produce young minds with knowledge and skills needed to match the demands of the job market. As someone once said, and I like this quote, education's purpose is to replace an empty mind with an open mind. That's what business wants, a fertile mind that is eager to use information in creative ways. So here are some key aspects of our approach to education. First, education is based on using knowledge, not memorizing facts. That's what a knowledge economy is all about. Students have to demonstrate their ability to go out, find information, and apply it in a practical way. So, for example, language exams should be about speaking the language, not about memorizing grammar or uh, recalling vocabulary. A geography test should have a lot of field work, far more field work than the exam in the classroom. In other words, the aim for education should be to teach people how to think rather than what to think. Second point, there should be a focus on skills as well as knowledge. University, after all, is intended to give people an experience and maturity, not just knowledge. So what are the development of skills that are needed? What are business people looking for? I think they're looking for leadership, teamwork, communication skills, being able to get on with people, having impact. These are the skills which are probably more important than the knowledge or the study or the subject that was studied. Third, I believe that the choice of subject should be based on a student's own interests. I think that if you like a subject, you're probably going to be good at it. Most parents in the UK are content to encourage their children to choose their degree subjects for themselves and not to pressurise them to take up a career path for reasons of history or for the prestige of the family. Fourth point, employers' preferences. These days, employers in the UK are more interested in recent experience and evidence of skills rather than the subject the job, job seeker has studied. And a, as a very good example, in the British Foreign Office, we do not take graduates of international relations. Our recruitment is based solely and squarely on certain knowledge. And I've had people that I've worked for have been mathematicians. My last boss in London was an astrophysicist and uh, he ended up as an ambassador in Brazil. That's an illustration of looking at the skills rather than the, the subject the person had studied.